Hey, I'm Jesse. Let's have a devotion. We're in Isaiah chapter 28. Woe to the majestic crown of Ephraim's drunkards and to the fading flower of its beautiful splendor, which is on the summit above the rich valley. Woe to those overcome with wine. Now in using the term Ephraim, he's now shifted his audience. He's speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel in reference by way of the name of its its largest tribe, Ephraim. So he's speaking now not to uh, not necessarily to to Judah, but to the rest of Israel, where the schism had taken place, uh, and now it's describing them as as good as dead, which is which is obviously very bad news. Look, the Lord has a strong and mighty one, like a devastating hailstorm, like a storm with strong flooding water. He will bring it across the land with his hand. The majestic crown of Ephraim's drunkards will be trampled underfoot. The fading flower of his beautiful splendor, which is on the summit above the rich valley, will be like a ripe fig before the summer harvest. Whoever sees it will swallow it while it is still in his hand. On that day, the Lord of armies will become a crown of beauty and a diadem of splendor to the remnant of his people, a spirit of justice to the one who sits in judgment and strength to those who repel attacks at the city gate. Even these stagger because of wine and stumble under the influence of beer. Priest and prophet stagger because of beer. They are confused by wine. They stumble because of beer. They are muddled in their visions. They stumble in their judgments. Indeed, all their tables are covered with vomit. There is no place without a stench. Who is he trying to teach? Who is he trying to instruct? Infants just wean from milk, babies removed from the breast, law after law, Law after law, line after line, line after line, a little here, a little there. He's speaking now about the negligence of the leadership of of Israel. They were speaking to people as if they were infants. And so their messages were redundant, were repetitive, were meaningless, were just overly embellished line after line, and that they're neglecting their duties. Once again, this has been a theme throughout. Isaiah, but he's zooming in specifically on leadership within the northern uh, the, the the northern kingdom of Ephraim, that they're in no position to teach. Now this one hits close to home for me because in my past I've struggled with alcohol, and so man, even though I've been repentant, still it reminds me of my own past sin, and it, it makes it 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 hurts a little bit to read, but it's the word of the Lord. I've got to read it to you. Um, but man, praise God, I'm repentant today. But wow, it just reminds you of the stakes about how seriously God takes, uh, you know, leadership that those who are called to judge, uh, go, those who are called to teach will be judged more strictly. Law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line, a little here, a little there. The state of the Talmud was such that it was overly embellished by people who just wanted to be published. They wanted to have something included. And so they would make up a rule about proper Sabbath practices. They would make up a new, a new, you know, permutation to the hand washing ritual that they would call Jesus and his disciples out for ignoring. Uh, they would it, they would do whatever it took to just add on another line, add on another law, and this massive tome of laws and regulations would just never end. And they were stupid. They were meaningless. God never inspired them. God never told these men to say these things. It's like what what Jeremiah the prophet would rebuke false prophets for. Those thoughts never entered my head. That never crossed my mind. You're making stuff up. So these were negligent leaders who were not doing what it took to actually minister to the people. They were not being true to what God actually said. They were making up their own words of God. Verse 11, you'll see this quoted in 1 Corinthians 14. For he will speak to this people with stammering speech and in a foreign language. He had said to them, this is the place of rest. Let the weary rest. This is the place of repose, but they would not listen. The word of the Lord will come to them law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line, a little here, a little there. So they go stumbling backward to be broken, trapped, and captured. The scariest words in the Bible have always been reserved for false teachers, not for people who don't know Christ but are struggling with their sin, beginning to feel conviction, desiring to repent, but struggling to really 
secure a new lifestyle in Christ, given some old bad habits. The, the scary words, the scariest words in the Bible are reserved for false teachers. Peter would write under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, blackest darkness is reserved for them. Their destruction has long been looming over them. It's said that their destruction has not been sleeping. These are the scariest words in scripture, and they're not meant for people who are just kind of struggling with their sin and, and trying to turn their lives around. It's meant for people who knew better, who knew what God's word said, but then said something different. These guys, wanted to add on to what God said. That's the classic formula for pagan faith systems, for false teachings. It doesn't simply say what God said. It takes what God said and then controverts it, subtly questions it. Did God really say this? And then it'll uh, attempt to add on to it. It'll try to yes and scripture or no but scripture, right? Yes and is a something that I'm told is used in improv classes where somebody says something and you're like, yeah, that's true. And also this to know, but is to say, no, that's not true. But this is think the Quran, think the watchtower publication, think the book of Mormon in first Corinthians chapter 14, Paul quoted verses 11 and 12 of this text. Here's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, where Paul was rebuking the church at Corinth. It was a charismatic church that had gone off the rails. They had, they had turned communion into a time to just all get together and get drunk. And uh, those who were rich were kind of showboating the communion that they brought from home to sort of put themselves above more poor people in the church by way of a status symbol. And they were practicing the gift of tongues without interpretation. Now, this is something that persists today in a lot of charismatic churches. And this is an utter disregard for what Paul patently, obviously, clearly just said what's written right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Brothers and sisters, don't be childish in your thinking, but be infants in regard to evil and adult in your thinking. It is written in the law, I will speak to this people by other tongues and by lips of foreigners, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Speaking in other tongues, then, is intended as a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church assembles together and all are speaking in other tongues, and people who are outsiders or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all are prophesying and some unbeliever or outsider comes in, he is convicted by all and is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart will be revealed, and as a result, he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming, God is really among you. So Paul quoted today's text, and he applied it to the church at Corinth in a way that perfectly still applies to every modern-day charismatic church that gives no regard for 1 Corinthians 14. He doesn't forbid speaking in tongues. That's crucial to know as well. But he says that I'd rather, I'd rather you speak five intelligible words than 10,000 words in a tongue. Because if somebody comes in and they hear you speaking, the whole church is talking in a language that they can understand, they're going to think you're crazy. But if they come in and they hear you speaking God's word, that's what it means to prophesy. Isaiah, a prophet, spoke what God told to him. And God described to Isaiah future events that had yet to take place. But now, upon the sealing of the canon of Scripture, to prophesy is to do this, right? Especially and more particularly when I'm preaching to the Redemption Church, that is an application's gift of prophecy, speaking the very words of God in a language that you can understand. The original intent for the gift of tongues at Pentecost was, in fact, exactly what Paul describes. It was assigned to unbelievers. The non-believers came and watched all these Jews who had gathered from every nation to observe Pentecost, and they were able to both speak and be understood. That's critical in Acts chapter 2. The real miracle of Acts chapter 2 was that people understood in their own languages. The work of the Tower of Babel, confounding man's speech, was lifted by the gift of tongues at Pentecost. And as a result, Jews from every nation of every dialect of Hebrew went home with the incredible news to their synagogues, perhaps, that Messiah had come. They knew the gospel in every language. Salvation is first for the Jew. That's what took place at Pentecost. And then for the Gentile, that would take place in Acts chapter 10, also accompanied by tongues, not out of pragmatic necessity, but this time as a confirmation to 
Peter to overcome the bias in his heart, showing him the Holy Spirit had poured out upon Gentiles at Cornelius's house, just as it had upon Jews at Pentecost, thereby leading Peter to say, the Holy Spirit has come upon these Gentiles just as he had upon us as Jews. Who are we to deny these men water to be baptized? So it was, in fact, in its original iteration, in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10, a sign definitely for unbelievers. That's what happened in the book of Acts. While prophecy is not for unbelievers, but for believers. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22, the second half of the sentence. If therefore the whole church assembles together and all are speaking in other tongues and people who are outsiders or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your minds? So he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 28, it's verses 11 and 12, and he's applying it to the New Testament church of Corinth. And in the original intent of Isaiah 28, here's the wording again, for he will speak to this people with stammering speech and in a foreign language. He had said to them, this is the place of rest, let the weary rest, this is the place of repose, but they would not listen. So God was telling these drunk, self-proclaimed prophets who were adding on to the word of God, line after line, a little here, a little there. He was calling them to repose. He was calling them to rest, but they would not listen. They continued to add on to what God said. He would come at them in multiple languages, but they would still not listen. This is what Paul quoted from in giving this New Testament application for the proper usage of the gift of tongues. The whole word of the Lord, uh, the word of the Lord would come to them law after law, law after law, line after line, line after line, a little here, a little there. So they go stumbling backward to be broken, trapped, and captured. I believe this refers to the way that they would be captured even in their own words, that they would, they would, uh, they would be caught in the very trap that they had set that they would not be able to live up to their own imaginary rules that they had added on to scripture. Uh, it's, it, it's possible as well that uh, these, these leaders of the church who were more given to partying than they were actually speaking the words of God, that he would speak to them in stammering speech and in a foreign language. This is possibly Akkadian, the language of the Assyrians. Uh, and this is, this is partly why Paul would also quote, uh, quote from this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And so this, uh, this pronouncement kind of shifts in its focus from the northern kingdom to the, the southern in the verses that follow, and we'll look at those tomorrow.